from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, my name is Mary Lou Reeker, and on behalf of the John W. Kluge Center of the Office of Scholarly Programs of the Library of Congress, I want to welcome you to a talk today by Dr. Mark Watson Geiger entitled, When Insider Trading Was Legal. Now, first of all, I want to ask you to please turn off your cell phones and to let you know that there will be questions at the end of the talk, time for that. But if you ask a question, it constitutes permission for us to record it and place it on our website. I also want to thank the John W. Kluge family for their support of the Kluge Center and the ongoing programs that we have at the Kluge Center. Uh, Dr. Mark Geiger received his MBA from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business and his PhD in history from the University of Missouri. His dissertation received the 2007 Alan Nevins Prize in American Economic History, awarded by the Economic History Association on behalf of Columbia University Press. His first book, Financial Fraud and Guerrilla Violence in Missouri's Civil War, 1861 to 1865, was published by Yale University Press in 2010 and earned him the Tom Watson Brown Prize for the best book on Civil War history published the previous year. So it earned that in 2011. The book also received the Francis B. Simpkins Award for the best first book on Southern history and the honorable mention and honorable mention for the Lincoln Prize from the Lehrman Foundation and Gettysburg College. Mark has also been published in numerous journals, including the Journal of Southern History, the Journal of Economic History, and um, many others. <laughs> Dr. Geiger, an independent scholar who is also an honorary resident fellow at the University of Sydney, Australia, has used his Kluge Fellowship to research his second book. That is on the history of the Chicago Board of Trade. And I think you're going to find this very intriguing because the topic looks at both the institutional setting for massive financial transactions, but also the constellation of actors involved in those long-term, uh, involved in those transactions and their long-term relationships with each other. So please help me welcome today Dr. Mark Watson Geiger. <laughs> okay, hello and thanks for coming. It's a small room. I'm not going to pay too much attention to the microphone. Everybody hear me okay? Right here? Okay. All right, as Mary Lou said, today I'm going to be talking about business practices on a key 19th century exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade, which during the period 1860 to 1890. The board has long been one of the power centers in the American economy, and it is an important topic in its own right. But we can also use the history of the Board of Trade to explore how exchanges worked when they were subject to no external oversight, and that is my broader purpose here. First, a little background. By exchange, I mean an organized, closed marketplace that specializes in a particular class of goods or services. New York Stock Exchange, for instance. Exchanges are one of the core institutions of capitalism with historical roots that extend back to the high Middle Ages. The first exchange that we know anything about was in Bruges, Belgium, started informally around 1285. This is a 16th century engraving of where it all began, van der Burst Square, which happens to be the origin of the term bourse. The first modern stock exchange was founded in Amsterdam in 1602, shown here in an engraving from about 1670. 
Fast forwarding another 200 plus years, this is the New York Stock Exchange in 1893. Even over such a long span of time, the family likeness still shows. Now, we have all seen pictures like these and read the accompanying news stories. These are just the most recent ones. Somebody passes or uses information that they should not, comes to the attention of the authorities, and walks the walk. There's some press notice, and then the story fades. Time some passes, and then the whole scenario repeats and repeats. These dramas have a particular resonance for me. Before I took up the study of history, I worked on Wall Street. I'd been on the job just over three months when federal agents came into our shop, grabbed a couple of our guys, and took them out in cuffs. It took us a while to calm down after that. But compared to the length of time that exchanges have been around, such laws are relatively recent. For most of their centuries-long history, financial markets have been subject to little external regulation other than the common civil and criminal codes. The United States has the strictest rules against insider trading and makes the most strenuous efforts to enforce them. But even here, measures against insider trading date only from the 1909 Supreme Court case, Strong versus Rapide. The major foundational law was the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934, Anybody know what I ought to do about that? Hmm? Okay. Well, here's hoping. Anyway, following the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, a long series of court cases, legislation, and administrative rules then followed. The most recent such measure is the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge, or Stock Act, signed into law by President Obama just over two weeks ago. Most European countries, however, had no laws against insider trading before the early 1990s. And even in the US, the SEC prosecutes under 200 cases a year, usually. Several eminent economists and jurists argue that insider trading regulations are at best ineffective and at worst harmful. So the situation is somewhat reminiscent of the war on drugs, which is to say eternal and possibly unwinnable. But I'm not here to discuss the merits of rules against insider trading. The point I want to make is, from an analytical perspective, the rules make it hard to understand how the markets work. Since insider trading is illegal, no one admits to doing it. But market participants can be pretty cynical. A commonly held view, attitude on Wall Street, is that these regulations will fail because insider trading is everywhere and impossible to eradicate. Further, that the chances of getting caught are so small that the laws are no deterrent. And behind this attitude, a further question, namely, how do you think the markets run anyway? The whole system revolves around rumor, back-channel information, favors done and repaid, relationships. So you could liken the markets, or anyway the people in them, to a half-trained dog that runs off as soon as you turn your back. Pursuing the dog analogy, a contemporary study of behavioral economics on the exchange floor would resemble the study of a trained animal. You could have a hard time sorting out which behavior comes from the trainer and which from the animal. But a historical study of an exchange can show something that no modern study can, namely, how exchange members behaved in their wild state. So, why study the Chicago Board of Trade? 
because compared to the other major exchanges, the Board of Trade is of relatively recent origin, 1848. Plentiful data survive to study what the members did and also how these patterns formed. The other major exchanges are too old and little documentation survives from their early years. So, first, a so little background. The Board of Trade is a physical place occupying an iconic Art Deco building at the foot of LaSalle Street in Chicago, shown here. Since 2007, CBOT, which I'll refer to it occasionally, has merged with its former crosstown rival, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, to form CME Group. CME, by some measures, is now the largest exchange in the world. The Board of Trade did not start out as an exchange, however, but rather as a chamber of commerce, where civic-minded businessmen would gather to discuss port improvements, street lighting, and similar measures. The organization did not flourish and almost expired early on for lack of interest. It limped on into the early 1850s, by becoming a general purpose market where goods of all, of all sorts changed hands. But from the latter 1850s, the institution found its true calling as a marketplace for agricultural produce. Here it was, too, that futures contracts originated sometime around 1860. And in the years following, the Board of Trade became the world's first exchange specializing in derivatives. This proved to be a revolutionary new market model, which spread, I have found, to New York by 1870, to Liverpool by 1873, and to London by 1878. By the early 1890s, futures trading had spread to other locations as well, in the US and Canada, and to Berlin, Paris, and Hamburg. This slide shows the Board of Trade in 1886, by which time the institution had traveled a long way from where it started. Now, the growth in membership shows how the institution took root and grew. From 31 members in 1850, the Board of Trade grew to about 200 members by 1855. But the organization really took off over the next decade reaching nearly 1,400 members by 1865. After the Civil War, the exchange significantly tightened its rules on membership requirements, and as a result, many members left. The purpose of this policy, one of the presidents of the exchange stated, was, quote, to exclude men of whom we know nothing, unquote. What had happened was, New members had stampeded into the exchange in the preceding decade, as you can see. It was a new way to make money, business was booming, and boomed further with contracts to supply the Union Army during the Civil War. There were so many new members that basic floor discipline was breaking down, and the board responded by becoming more and more a closed club. Now what drove the board's growth was geography, which gave Chicago unbeatable advantages as the business center for Midwestern agriculture. Chicago is here at the lower end of Lake Michigan. And in 1825, the completion of the Erie Canal from Albany to New York. gave a through transportation route by water for bulk freight all the way from the coastline of the Great Lakes to New York City and from there to the world. Then in 1848, the completion of the Illinois and Michigan Canal gave Chicago access to the Mississippi River as well. Now in the following decades, the railroads overlaid the water transport network. Chicago is and always has been the major rail hub for the North American interior, 
as this 1870 map shows. So the products of Midwestern agriculture, originally cereal grains, but later processed pork as well, funneled from this whole vast hinterland into Chicago for processing and or transshipment to points east. And as the physical goods moved through Chicago, legal, legal title to the goods moved through the Chicago Board of Trade. In 1855, the London Economist called Chicago the largest grain market in the world, and so it remained for the next century. During the period of which I speak, broker-dealers in the grain trade and men who worked in the industries that supported it, namely the ones listed here, transport, storage, finance, insurance, and food processing, milling, malting, brewing, distilling, composed between 81% and 88% of all the members. And this is the group that I am chiefly concerned with here. So what did members of the exchange do when government regulation was non-existent? Well, things could get rough indeed. During the mid-19th century, the Board, of Trade, the Board of Trade members routinely floated false rumors to manipulate prices, going so far as to print fake trade circulars. Once, a cabal of members sent bogus Frenchmen to the trading floor supposedly to buy vast quantities of wheat for the armies of Napoleon III. The intent was to run up the price of wheat, allowing the plotters to unload their holdings at great profit. As an indication of how times have changed, the Chicago Tribune's account of this incident was not full of righteous anger about this outrageous fraud perpetrated on the public. Instead, it read like a humorous account of some non-murderous fraternity prank laughing at the antics of these lads on the Board of Trade, things they got up to. But rather like a fraternity house, the Board of Trade was a world apart, and this is typical of exchanges. This is the way they wanted it, and they worked at it. Around 1870, the United States, the, rather the Illinois legislator, legislature started encroaching on what the Board of Trade considered its turf, by passing a law have relating to grain inspection. The exchange responded by urging its members to disobey the law and pledging to pay legal expenses that might arise from being arrested and prosecuted. Now, even though, so even so there was no external oversight that we would now recognize as such, Relations between the Board of Trade and the outside world were sometimes fraught. Some of the earliest press coverage the Board of Trade got was to report mass arrests on the floor of the exchange. The charge, however, was gambling, rather than any of the other many things that they did that would be illegal now. Being labeled gamblers was the major regulatory worry that the exchange had then. A significant number of legislators and their constituents thought the Board of Trade was a degenerate gambling hell that should be shut down to prove that crime didn't pay. So in its public pronouncements, the Board of Trade was at pains to present itself as an indispensable public service, a key intermediary in the agricultural economy, and the farmer's friend. But middlemen are seldom loved, and sometimes the Board of Trade would trip over its own feet in 1888, the newly elected president of the exchange, Charles L. Hutchinson, delivered a pious speech about the vital marketing functions performed by the exchange, how it transferred risks from parties that did not wish to bear it to parties that did, and so forth. Hutchinson's father, Benjamin Hutchinson, a legendary speculator and a decades-long member of the exchange, was in the audience. and He interrupted his son's speech to hoot at him you hear that, boys? Charlie says we're philanthropists. Why, bless my buttons, we're gamblers. You're a gambler. I'm a gambler. We're all gamblers. Ha, ha, ha. The press got hold of this story, and as you can imagine, it was a setback in uh, the Board of Trade's quest for respectability. Even so, 
the various government authorities largely let the Board of Trade alone and allowed it to conduct its business as it saw fit. As long as ordinary citizens did not have their money tied up in the place, people cared little about what exchange members did to each other. But the place was not lawless. A few rules of conduct were taken extremely seriously, and by and large, they survive today. And these were, mem these were rules that the members enforced themselves. First, members only. You could not trade unless you were a member. And second, a member's word was his bond. This was and is a prime directive. A member who reneged on a trade risked expulsion from the exchange. But even if he got to stay, his name would be poison, and he might as well leave. Similarly, a member paid his debts. You might take a terrible beating in the marketplace and lose your net worth many times over. But if you wanted to stay in the game, you paid what you owed, even if it took you years. Another rule, the exchange would not tolerate giving false weight or, may or grade. And finally, what happened on the exchange stayed on the exchange. An arbitration committee settled disputes that members could not resolve among themselves, and these judgments were final. The exchange might not expel you if you sought redress outside in the courts, but you'd have to cope with a lot of ill will after that. Now, if you went to CME, formerly the Board of Trade, you'd see something like this. Financial markets have largely moved to electronic trading in the past six or seven years, though the older open outcry model is still viable. But for most of the preceding centuries that exchanges have been around, you would see something more akin to the scene in 1886. Here, as the Board of Trade appeared in about 2000, a great open space and a great crowd. About 1,000 people on the trading floor at any one time. This is how it looked close up, and here, closer still. So how did members do business with one another? First, you might wonder how it was possible to communicate at all in an environment like this. As these pictures suggest, this place was loud. Think of a crowded stadium when the home team makes a big score, except the volume level of the exchange was always like that, pretty much. So instead of speaking or even shouting, which would be useless, the members used hand signals, like these two. You might suppose the fellow on the right is exasperated, and he may well be, but what people on our side of the screen are going to see is an offer to buy a quantity of 50 of whatever is trading. Now this signaling system is a famous feature of business on the Board of Trade, but it's only partly homegrown. The topic has scarcely been touched, but there is a shared culture among exchanges where floor practices and rules are copied back and forth from one location to another. In the earliest years of the Board of Trade, members called out their bids and offers to one another. This became impractical as the number of members grew. Here, by 1891, they're using signals. You see here, also here, here. The details are hard to see from where you sit, but I counted six separate hand signals in this illustration. And across the country, 22 years earlier, this is the New York Gold Exchange in 1869. Again, you see signals. This, by the way, was what was happening on Black Friday, September 24th, 1869, the day that Jay Gould and Diamond Jubilee Jim Fisk tried to corner the gold market. Hand signals again. And this engraving here is the earliest picture I have been able to find of floor action at the New York Stock Exchange. And again, note with the hands. Now, the size of the crowd on a trading floor poses a different sort of communications problem. An exchange floor is an intensely personal environment. 
These guys see each other every day of their working lives and see more of each other than they do of their own families. And the key to survival on the exchange is to know your counterparties, who you could trust, who you couldn't, who could pay, who would pay. As Leo Malamud, the former chairman of CME Group, put it, to know exactly where the other guy's level of pain is. So you form networks, members with whom you routinely trade, and friends and business associates to whom you look for support. Conversely, you identify rivals, personal enemies, untrustworthy people and groups. I have started to map these networks using data drawn from the annual reports published by the Board of Trade every year from 1858 on. And that is a work in progress. I have not yet looked at family relationships, which I suspect are going to be huge. And many other important sources of data on relationships remain untapped. This slide shows network connections among members in the grain trade and supporting industries in 1860. In that year, there were 660, 664 members total 577 were in the grain trade and supporting industries. And so far, I have identified 233, or 40% of that group, who had a connection to one or more other members. Each dot here represents a member, and the diagram shows only those members with at least one connection. I left out the members without a connection that I could find, and who would have appeared only as single dots. Yellow dots are exchange officials, the president, vice presidents, directors, and members of the different governing committees. The black dots are members connected through business firms. The dumbbells are two-man partnerships, and the triangles are three-man partnerships. You see, too, also, here, two four-man partnerships. So, Compared to what came later, the exchange in 1860 is a pretty uncomplicated place. Here is the same group in 1870, members involved in the grain trade and supporting industries. The 1870 map looks more crowded because there are more members overall, but in fact, the percentage of network members is almost exactly the same. Even so, at a glance you can see that this diagram looks more complex. Things change more noticeably in 1880 and even more so in 1890. So several things are happening here over this time span. First of all, a higher proportion of members are networked in 1890 than in 1860. After 1870, the network percentage rose steadily from 39% in that year to 51% in 1890. Second, you can see that the network components, these separate little floating islands here, have become much more complex. In 1860, the majority of the network components are two-man partnerships. The 1890 exchange still has plenty of those, but it also has eight, 10, and 12 person firms, which didn't exist at all in 1860. Also, you can see, looking at the yellow dots, that exchange administration was much simpler in 1860 than it became by 1890, and also, too, that more firms have connections with exchange officials than was true in the earlier period. And finally, in 1890, a higher proportion of members are employees. In 1860, most of the two and three man groupings are partnerships. By 1890, these larger groupings typically consist of a proprietor and two or three partners, and the other members of the firm are employees. So an increasing number of exchange members are not doing business as equals, but instead take orders from somebody else. Now what drives this process of 
progressively more and more complex networking is a survival advantage that networked members gained over non-networked members. Network members last longer on the exchange than non-networked members do. The exception to that is in the period 1865 to 1870 during the period of shakeout that I referred to earlier. But at other times, a network member enjoyed a survival advantage over non-network members of between 40 and 50 percent. Now, so far I've only shown you connections among members on the exchange itself. But many members had ties to one another outside the exchange. The 1870 Chicago Directory named the members of corporate boards of directors. This slide shows a page from that directory uh, that lists Chicago banks and insurance companies. And the highlighted members here are the names of members of the Board of Trade. And these members, exchange members, completely dominate some of these companies. This map is the same one that I showed you a few minutes ago of connections among members on the exchange in 1870. This map shows those same connections plus off-exchange connections among members via banks, insurance companies, and the Masonic Lodges. The black dots are members who have connections on the exchange only. The yellow dots are members who are connected off the exchange, and the red dots are members who have connections of both kinds. Note that there are many more red dots than yellow ones, and that most of the off-exchange connections are among members who are already extensively networked on the exchange. This comparison is going to be harder to make for other years. The 1870 directory is the only one I have seen that names company directors. But already by that time, the Board of Trade members were a powerful presence in all of the support industries except the railroads. At that time, most railroad corporations had their headquarters in New York, though many later moved to Chicago. So does this matter? that these people control the grain trade in Chicago and are a strong presence in the supporting industries as well? Well, yeah, it does. As I said, throughout this period, Chicago was the largest grain market anywhere, and the Board of Trade influenced the world price of grain more than any other single organization. At times, during the 1880s, up to one quarter of the wheat consumed in Britain came from the United States. Much of that came from Chicago, and all of it was priced on the Board of Trade. Another measure of Chicago's commercial reach is provided by William Cronin in his prize-winning book, Nature's Metropolis. Cronin used bankruptcy court records from 1873 and 1874 to discover where Chicagoans did business. So I'll just say, if you were in the Midwest, and if you were in agriculture, the Board of Trade was never far away. Now, another important trend during this time was the turnover among members dropped significantly. After the membership dip in the later 1860s, the headcount grew again until it stabilized between 1,800 and 1,900 members during the 1880s. These new members had stiffer entrance requirements to meet, however, including the entry fee. As a chamber of commerce, the Board of Trade assessed only token annual dues from its members, and membership was open to any business person of good character. For the first 21 years of the Board's existence, members paid an entry fee of $5. Beginning in 1869, however, the fee rose successively to $25 $100, $1,000, and then finally to $10,000 in 1883. So you didn't join the Board of Trade frivolously for just a chance roll of the dice. Those who did join were men of means and serious business to conduct. By 1880, the membership contained a much higher proportion of long-term members than had ever been true before. In 1865, 
76 per cent of the members had joined in the previous five years. By 1890, that number was 30 per cent. So what did it take to become a long-term member? Looking back from 1890, there are some members of 25 and 30 years standing. And it turns out that many of these men took similar career paths. And it went something like this. First, the member starts out with a sponsor. As I've shown, such a connection improved the chances of the member of surviving the first few years on the exchange. But before five years have passed, the future long-term member leaves his original firm and strikes out on his own. Also in this middle period, he'll start to form off-exchange connections with other members. And an easy way to do that would have been to join a fraternal lodge. Those were much more popular in the mid-19th century than they are now, uh, including many lodges, the Druids, the Chaldeans, the nice sons of Pythias, Knights of Pythias, the sons of Hermon, that have just completely disappeared from the scene. Some of these lodges met weekly. Around year 10, though some prodigies would start sooner, this member would start getting involved in exchange administration. And the easiest route there would be to join one of the less prestigious and more tedious governance committees. Later still, sometime around, sometime after year 10, the member should start expanding the firm. He might add a partner or two or else start hiring help. The larger groupings that you saw in the 1890 network map all centered around one or more very long-term members. So let me exchange, explain where I think these different trends are leading. Because of the restrictive, restrictive membership policies and the survival advantage that they enjoy, networked members are crowding out non-networked members. Nepotism is clearly present as well showing in the names and affiliations of the new members joining in the 1880s. The power structure of the exchange also is becoming more defined, and an increasing number of members report to somebody. I think the membership group as a whole is evolving toward what sociologists term a small world network, of which this is an example. As you can see, a small world network has local centers of power, unlike a hierarchical network like a corporation, a military command, or a government agency. A small world network is better able to survive the loss of a power center than a hierarchical network. But a small world network is also harder to control or to change. As seen from the trading floor, a small world network would look like an assortment of coalitions, clans, or cliques competing with one another. Now, as to the kind of organization the Board of Trade was becoming and its relations with the larger economy, I'll relate a story told by the former judge, congressman, and University of Chicago law professor, Abner Mikva. When he entered the University of Chicago Law School in 1848, Illinois Democrats had a great slate of candidates. Inspired by the high quality of these men, Abner Mikva went to the ward committeeman's office in his neighborhood to volunteer to help any way he could. Hand out leaflets, get voters to register, whatever. After he had said his piece, the committeeman, Timothy O'Sullivan, asked him, who sent you? Nobody, Mikva replied. O'Sullivan said, we don't want nobody that nobody sent. In other words, in 1948, the Chicago Democratic machine was a closed shop. Unless you knew somebody, you didn't get in. So too with the Board of Trade during these years that I have been discussing. Throughout the period under discussion, the Board of Trade was a members only club, but to become a member was getting harder and harder. And what do these men look like up close? Some members were rich indeed. Philip D. Armour, the meatpacking king, Marshall Field of the famous department store, Cyrus McCormick, 
McCormick Reaper and International Harvester, and George Pullman, inventor of the Pullman Palace car and founder of the company, were all members of the Board of Trade at the same time in the 1880s. But they were very much the exception. Most members looked more like this illustration of the trading floor there in 1880, titled The Flurry in Wheat. Little men, mostly, scrambling for a dollar. And this is true of exchanges generally, except for Jay, a few standouts, Jay Gould, for instance. Individual exchange members here and elsewhere were seldom more than locally prominent, and often not that. Armour and Pullman were prominent in spades, and they were the targets of much hostility during their lifetimes. When Pullman died in 1897, he was buried under several tons of concrete so that ill-wishers couldn't dig him up and desecrate his body. But that had nothing to do with his being a member of the Board of Trade. Now, I'm about done here. I will say this in speculation to close up that I think that the power of exchanges tends to go unnoticed at that time and also this. Everybody knows about the New York Stock Exchange, but there are many more exchanges than that. And even a place as big as CME is largely unknown to most Americans. And it's because I think that you don't have somebody that you can point to, a Rockefeller or a Vanderbilt, who live large and become symbols of waste and excess and anything else you want to attach to them. But these little men wield great power when they're welded together into an exchange. And their power does not reside in their individual selves, but in how they relate to one another. So do these relationships still matter at a time when most trading is done like this? Well, yeah, I think so. It's not that these re that personal relationships in financial markets have become obsolete, but rather that they now run through a new channel, as shown in this map of social networking on Facebook. And with that, I will close. And thank you for your time, for coming, and for listening. Yes, sure. If there are any. Yeah. Uh, I was interested in your visualizations of the networks. You need something quite How did you quantify relationships? Um, you mean as to, uh, as to weighting them? I, 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 Um, what counts is some kind of identifiable connection. Um, for instance, being members of the, uh, of, of the same board of directors at the same time, uh, or being members of a business firm. That was where I started. Like I said, I haven't gotten really deep into this, doing the families. But the uh, annuals of the Board of Trade printed uh, data on what firms the members belong to. So I could see... Um, Geiger and Arnest. Okay, and Geiger and Arnest happen both to be members of the exchange, then that forms one of those dumbbells. So that was it. Ditto to uh, the administration of the exchange, which is, also, uh, which is also identified in these books. Anything else? Yes? Um, the, it was the head offices uh, that were in New York. All of the railroads in 1870 were headquartered in New York. Um, but they later moved to Chicago. Um, but uh, during this period, it was New Yorkers that were on the boards of, the, uh, of them. Now, they were, Board of Trade members were heavily represented 
in freight forwarding, ship brokerage, um, and um, steamboat lines, but not the railroads, not yet anyway. I'm not sure. I, I, I think they moved piecemeal. I'm not sure about that, though. Thank you. Sure. Is there any way that you can imagine um, that you could practice and visualize um, those who can't practice on Facebook? Would they still be published? Through published sources, yes, I think so. Um, what I hope to do with this is use it as a pilot study, remote as it is for understanding um, exchange modern exchange floors, both the earlier the physical floors of the open outcry system and then they're morphing into uh, the virtual exchanges that we now see. But uh, even in this earlier period, there are tons of sources that, uh, will that tell who is connected to who. A simple way of going about it now would just be doing simply a, uh, a search on names Exchanges publish the lists of their members. And um, you can look, and this is something that we would have to do with software, uh, but uh, you can look for a name and is it paired with any of these other names? Do they show up uh, in the same newspaper article? And so then this then pulls up you know, something to look at. Are these guys connected or not? So um, I don't think there's going to be any problem at all in identifying connections among, peop among people. Does anyone else study these things? There is, uh, I'm, there isn't much. Um, as I said, I think that exchanges are relatively under the radar. There is now um, some interest um, and some scholarship happening on virtual on the virtual exchanges, but um, but not on the previous seven centuries of exchange existence. So, um, no, there, is, there really isn't much. This is new as far as I know. I, uh, it was a lot of work, let me tell you, to get those network maps together. And I certainly didn't want to do it if somebody else already had. So I looked pretty hard. Didn't find them. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, they did, those rules that I named were kind of like the Ten Commandments. They're the, they're the foundational rules, but as they moved on, um, they did wind up with more, um, more detailed rules about how business was to be conducted, um, particularly um, weather reports and news reports, for instance. They started getting the telegraph into the exchange because they wanted to have um, accurate news um, and get away from the false rumor stuff. Not that there was an enforcement here, um, but, they did, but they did that. Now, during the 1860s, market corners uh, were a serious problem, which is to say members, or a cabal of members, buying up all of the available supply of some commodity, number one wheat, let's say, and then anybody who has a contract to deliver at some future date is going to get choked because they can't buy this stuff because it's all owned by somebody else. And they've got to come to you, and you then charge them for whatever you can, you can shake out of them. And uh, this was deemed to be quite destructive. Um, certainly it got them a lot of bad press, but the members got up in arms about it too because a lot of people got shot full of holes in this way. So they started making rules against, against corners. So yes, that was something which was, which was frowned upon. Though um, I have not seen in this period that they were really able to stop it either. Anybody else? Yes. Mm-hmm. Small world network. Small world network. Did that just sort of fall out or did you have to do it? 
That, uh, that diagram is of something else. That's just, an, that's just an example of a small world network of what one looks like. That has nothing to do with the Board of Trade. Uh, that is, however, where I think things are headed, as I said. Um, I used PIEC, uh, is the uh, network mapping software that I used for the, uh, it's, it's PIEC, and that is spelled P-A-J-E-K, um, which means spider in Slovenian. And it means that because network diagrams look rather like spiders. And this was developed, the software was developed by two mathematicians at the University of Ljubljana. Um, it is uh, relatively easy to use and it's, it, has, it is pretty good in visualizations. This is an exploding field in sociology and has been now for a good 15 or so years. And it's mainly software driven because, uh, as you can see, the net diagrams of relationships get very complex very fast. And if you have to do it on pencil and paper, uh, it quickly gets away from you. Anybody else? Yes? Else? Yes. How did they react? Um, that well, that happened um, well after the period that I've studied, so I can't speak authoritatively about that. Um, it happens that um, that such laws are much less, much sketchier uh, for commodities trading than they are for securities trading, anyway. Um, to the uh, disgust of many regulators who think that commodities markets are nothing but sleaze all the way down. Anything else? Well, thank you so much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.